Alright everyone, welcome back to some more of the house in Fata Morgana. Thank you all again for the love and support you continue to show this series. I greatly appreciate it. So at this moment guys, I don't know how we're going to get out of the tight situation we're in man. It's, it's looking pretty grim. But we're going to keep reading on and see how it goes. So I hope you all continue to enjoy watching and let's keep it going. Alright, and we are back. I'll ask you again. Who told you? Ugh. Morgana did. She, she dies on the day of the Harvest Festival. Next up is your ring finger. And then your middle. If you insist on keeping this up. I'm telling you the truth. She bears so much hatred. She casts a curse on your souls. I've seen what happens in your next life. Now you're resorting to souls and next lives? I'm genuinely impressed. What lies are you going to cook up next, white-haired knave? If I don't set Morgana free, your souls will be enslaved for all eternity, imprisoned in this cursed mansion. When the bell tolls noon, on the day of the Harvest Festival, you'll lose everything. All of you will. You cannot escape it unless you do something. And the nun, the reason you locked Morgana up in the first place, she won't be safe either. She'll be killed. Two fingers left. Can you keep up the act that long? Everything I'm saying is the truth. I've seen it all with my own two eyes. Why are you so insistent on maintaining this farce? Is it to protect the boy? Or do you have some other motive? Every last word is true. Continuing to lie isn't going to make this any easier. Your voice is shaking. The pain is starting to get to you, isn't it? What you're doing to Morgana, it achieves nothing. You must release her and atone for your sins. Otherwise your soul and the souls of those you care about will be doomed to suffering. I see what this is now. You don't have the information I want, so all you can do is spin these lies. Ugh, you thick skull bastard. There are other options though. Beg me for mercy. Sob like a little child, sniveling your please don't kill me's and I don't want to die's and it hurts so bad please stops. Grovel on the ground you tiny pathetic man and if you can entertain me, maybe I'll consider it. I will never shed another tear. And I will never beg for your damn mercy. Nothing I've said to you has been a lie. Some cheap attempt to fool you into letting me go. Every word of it is true. I know the sins you've burdened your soul with. I know the fate that awaits you in your next life. And I will gladly tell you every detail. You're down to just your thumb. Now, go on if you're so eager to tell me. Let's hear about my supposed next life, shall we? In your next life, you lose your memory in an accident, causing you to forget your own humanity. The innate savagery you normally keep hidden beneath a mask is released, unrestricted, and you turn into a creature no more than... No, you turn into a beast. My mask? You murder countless people, including the woman you once called your lover. Lover? Hers is a name you know very well. Pauline, your tether. My tether. How do you know that word? Because I know everything. I know what you wanted. I know what you were never able to obtain. You idolize humanity and you yearn for peace. You're telling me I killed the nun in my next life? I am. That is the fate that lies waiting for you. Her love for you is so strong and she refuses to believe you're dead. 
She leaves you seaside hometown in search of you, and she finds you. But you, you slaughter her. Did you say she lived in a city on the sea? In addition to her, you also lose someone else. A woman who tried to give you the peace you so desired, which eventually causes you to succumb entirely to instinct. Enough! Ah, God, God, ah. All right, fine. Now I know what you are. You know you're no more seasoned liar. You're some kind of evil spirit that deceives humans. You're peering into my heart, tailoring your lies specifically to manipulate me. I am not. I swear, I've seen everything that happens. Enough. Gah, there's a chance you can change your fate. All you have to do is cease your involvement in Morgana's imprisonment. Set her free. I'll lay the hatred she bears for you. Are you deaf? I've said I heard enough. Release Morgana. Save your soul. Give her a better future. Silence! God. I think. I think I'll take your arm off first. Cut right through your shoulder, nice and slowly. Don't. <laughs> You'll still be attached for a while, yet don't you worry. You hear that spirit? That's the sound of your flesh ripping apart. The sound of your muscles being severed. Ah. Uh, uh, uh. Ha. Not gonna be done talking anymore, are you? Oh, sorry. Not gonna be doing much talking anymore, are you? Not through the pain, you aren't. Uh, uh, uh. Plead for your life, spirit. Beg for mercy. Admit it was all a sham. Apologize. Let the room fill your cries of agony. Nothing was a sham. Every last word, it's all the truth. I'll rip the head right off your shoulders. I don't care who or what you are anymore. You're deceased. You will do no such thing. Get back. You will not harm him any further. Pauline. What? What are you doing here, Pauline? I told you to stay away. And the door. The door was locked. I opened it. You. One of Nellie's Harris pins was long enough to get into the lock and undo it. She won't be getting much use out of it anymore, though. Busted it up pretty badly in the process. The locks in the tower door are too complex, but the one here is a lot simpler. Bet you never expected me to go cat burglar on you, huh? You stupid boy. Oh, what was your question last night again? Something about being on the edge of a cliff or whatever? Well, here's your answer. I'll do everything I can to save the both of them. This is terrible. How could you? Oh my, you're badly hurt. Sit tight. I'll call for a doctor. Don't worry about me. You need to talk to him, to get him to talk. We've got to do something about you, though. I'll get that wound patched up at least until you can get it properly checked out. Thank you. Was it you who went to get Pauline? No, I ran into her while I was looking for you, which is when she told me she was looking for him. Neither of us were, going, were having much luck, so we scoured the mansion together. But when we reached the stairs to the cellar and heard the screaming, my worst fears were confirmed. So I picked the lock and here we are. Sorry we didn't make it sooner. This could have been avoided. God, look at what he did to you. There's so much blood. in your fingers. No. We made it just in time. My arm's still attached. And I'm not dead. Neither of which would be true without you. So I guess that means I actually did something good for once. Did something for someone other than myself. That you did. So 
So everything Mikkel said is true. The Lord is in storing his valuables in the tower. He's got a girl locked up there. Well, is it true or not? It's still the Lord's property either way. The church is being funded with her miracle blood, so that makes her valuable, yes. So you're saying, I've been handing out human blood? I've been telling people it was medicine? Not human. Witch. No. Morgana is a human girl. She hasn't become a witch yet, at least not here. All this time, I've been lying to the people who believed in me, without even knowing what I was doing. Like you said, you didn't know. You haven't done anything wrong. Ignorance does not excuse sin. All that time I spent with you, and I didn't notice anything wrong. That was the idea. You weren't supposed to notice anything. It's not your fault I deceived you. It's unreasonable to think you should have been able to. All that. You did it to help me though, didn't you? It's like a stupid little girl. I assumed it was all out of the good of your heart. Never once stopping to think any deeper than that about where it was all coming from. Maria was right. I was blind. I was content to be pleased about the people I thought it was helping. I want you to do something for me. I want you to set this girl, set Morgana free. Please, do not make your sins any greater than they already are. But without the witch's blood, we lose the Lord's patronage, and then the church. What good is church? What good is a church that isn't actually saving anyone? Actually, no. That's avoiding the point entirely. What do you mean? To, to tell you the truth, I. I never really cared about the church at all. You... What? How can you say that when you've always been so unconditionally charitable, even if it meant giving away food or money you needed yourself? People call you the saintess because that's what you are. A saint. It's true. I do do that. But the fact is, I'm no saint. I don't deserve to be held up as one, nor do I belong in that position. I'm just an ordinary girl. I never wanted to be a nun, you know. I just didn't have any other options available to me. And I sure didn't have the confidence to make it out there on my own like Maria. So I did as I was told. And to keep myself from thinking it was a mistake, from feeling dissatisfied with that choice, I put everything I had into my responsibilities to the church. My unconditional charity was rooted entirely in selfishness. And the longer I kept it up, the harder it became to stop. I forgot what I really wanted. And what would that be? A normal, happy life as an ordinary girl. In a city on the water. What? That's what you said in your, your dream was, or your next life. Ah, right. Yeah, a quiet life with the man I love. You might... You might get that wish, in fact. Huh? You. That's what you said, wasn't it? That in her next life, she lives in a city by the sea? That is correct. In your next life, Pauline, you are not a nun. You're an ordinary girl who lives in the seaside city. A sweet, cheerful, energetic girl who wears her heart on her sleeve. You have both your mother and father. And I. So you, believe me now. I don't know. Your claims are utterly ridiculous. But it's getting harder to think you're lying. If that's what you really wanted, Pauline, what should I have done instead? I envied what you had, that solace. The last thing I wanted was for you to lose it. But you're saying you found no peace in that life. That's right. So what should I have done? I wanted you to take me away from this place somewhere far away. I wanted you to make it so I could be Pauline, not Marie. That would have been my ideal life. To live with you. To have a family with you. How? How was I supposed to know? You couldn't possibly have known. I realized that. And that makes me every bit as complicit as you. Set Morgana free. 
I will be expected to pay for my crimes. That itself is not a problem. I have every intention of facing the consequences. But we have done terrible and gruesome things. I don't know what the usual punishment for such is in this land. But if I had to guess, I would say execution. And me being an outsider makes it easier for people to place the blame on me. I won't be able to take you away. We'll find each other again in our next lives, okay? Okay. As I'm sure you heard, my involvement in this conspiracy ends here. I'm glad to hear you decide to take action. Ooh. I didn't see that part. What is that? Sorry about your fingers and arm. I'm still alive. That's what matters. Oh, I would hold a huge grudge against him. <laughs> the third key is in the Lord's possession. You said you needed it by noon of the Harvest Festival, yes? Which means we need to act quickly. That's correct. We must set Morgana free before the bell tolls noon tomorrow. Then tonight. That's the next time the Lord will be here. Tonight, I'll kill him and take his key. Wait! No! We're not shedding any blood to get his key. D do you remember what I said a few minutes ago about not committing any further sins? He is not likely to hand over the key without a fight, though. We need to convince him, not force his hand. Besides, simply opening the door isn't enough. Why not? My goal here is to save Morgana's soul. In order to do that, I need to pacify at least some degree of the hatred she bears in it. A hatred rooted in her perception of you and the things you've done to her. I need to change that perception. I'm not quite following. What do you mean by change her perception? For you and the Lord to tell your stories to describe what happened from your perspectives. You want my perspective. I do. Something in your motivations or your circumstance, circumstances might serve to lessen the animosity she holds for you. The greater, dis the greater the discrepancy in what she believes to be the truth and the full story with everyone's perspectives included, the greater the chance she may have, change she may have a change of heart. Okay, I now understand what you want from me. However, my perspective will do nothing to serve that end. There is no ambiguity, no justification for my actions. Regardless, I would still like to know the whole truth, if you're willing to tell me your part of it. Okay. I'll come by your room later today. Hey! Is it alright if I'm there too? Sorry, I would rather if you weren't. Why? Everything you need to know, I've told you already. I captured a witch. No, I kidnapped a young girl for profit and imprisoned her in the tower. My motivation, as I said, was to keep your church funded. Those are the facts. You also cut off her arm, but I guess we're gonna leave that out, right? The things I did along the way were brutal and inhumane. I hope you can understand why I wouldn't want the woman I love to hear any of that. I understand. I'll see you again later in the day. I'll be waiting. Wow, I can't believe we got through to him. I should get going too. You're going to need medication and something to get that arm dressed properly. And if there's anything else I can get you, let me know. If you want to see a doctor, I'll find you the best one I can. I'm so sorry for ever doubting you. No, I understand. I'm glad you came at all. Me too. Well, see you. I'm kind of surprised. He's actually got a soft spot, huh? And I was sure you were full of it when you said the two of them had a thing going. What does she see in a guy like him anyway? She's got bad taste in guys, that's for sure. What? What's with that look? Just admiring your rather inappropriate remarks. Ah, uh, sorry. I was just so relieved it kind of came out. It's okay. You almost got a smile out of me. I've never seen you smile before. I blame being relieved too. Now, would you mind helping me get back to my room? 
I also realized this is also one of the few things we were able to resolve on our own without Giselle's help. So I guess that was also part of the whole process as well because I think it's going to be up to Mikkel alone to handle this. Sure, no problem. My shoulder is all yours. You know, you really are something else, Mikkel. I could hear you through the door as I was getting it opened. And I honestly, I'm amazed you were able to stand up to him like that. I don't want to get my hopes up too high just yet, but I'm starting to think you might actually be able to do something about the Lord. That's reassuring. Thank you. Sure. Anyway, let's get going. You should get as much rest as you can until he shows up. Well, I mean, you should be going to see a doctor with these wounds. Oh yeah, Nelly's been worried sick about you all day. I'll have to tell her not to pounce on you because I'm sure she'll come running as soon as she hears we found you. Giselle, you were right. I do have people here who, was, who will support me. People who are grateful for me and who show concern for me. But you have to know, Giselle, that's your voice I want to hear more than anyone else's. Why can I not hear you? Where are you, Giselle? Giselle. It's almost sunset. Looks like the snow didn't stick. You couldn't actually see the snow last night, could you, Giselle? Was that when the light started fading from the sphere of darkness encasing you? Or had it been going on even longer than that? Why didn't you say anything? Not a word. I don't believe you're gone for good. You're still out there somewhere. I know it. And I will come for you. I swear it. Just a moment. Here I am, as promised. I heard you talking, so I thought there was someone with you. But you're alone. It's only me, yes. I see. As I told you earlier, my perspective on events will do nothing to change Morgana's mind. I would still like to hear what you have to say. Hmm, all right. Not being from this land, I don't believe in the local god. Nor do I think priests and preachers any better than con artists. Where did that come from? What I'm trying to say is if I give a confessional, it won't be to another human. You're an angel. Come again? The angel from the stained glass window. That's you, isn't it? Wait, wait, how on earth did you come to that conclusion? I was thinking about everything you said earlier in the cellar. The fact that you knew about Morgana, the fact that you could see into my heart, and in particular, all your talk about saving people's souls. Salvation is not a man's job. Which means you must be something else. I'm... I will tell you everything. Every foolish mistake. Every terrible crime. And in exchange, I would like you to tell me what I am to do next to lead me down the path I am to take. I... I terrify myself. With every passing day, my ability to tell that what direction I'm supposed to be heading in dulls. So after I tell my story, I want you to do that for me. Please, will you show me the way? I... I can no more decide the path you take than you, but you saw into my heart. Giselle, if you were here, you would encourage me to agree to his request, wouldn't you? Okay. I can't guarantee that anything I'll have to say will be of use, but I will do the best I can to lead you in the right direction. Thank you. Now, before I begin, there's one thing I need to clarify. I am not in love with Pauline. She does play an important role in my life though. That much is true. She's your, te your tether. Exactly. I also, I suppose you could say, admire her. She's everything I am not. Everything I cannot be. Is that something I should tell her, you think? That I don't love her? That I'm incapable of feeling love? Should I tell her that knowing she genuinely loves me? 
My instinct tells me I shouldn't. I know very well I'm lying to her. But there are circumstances in which a lie is preferable to the truth, are there not? With that said, I'm ready to begin. You have my full attention. Alright, we're gonna learn about his past now. I guess the official truth. As you know, I am not from this land. The issue is, I don't know any more about where I came from than you. I remember the Silk Road, stretching out before me as far as the eye can see. Clouds of dust wisping across the bare dirt trail. That endless expanse of red earth remains branded into the very fabric of my mind. But beyond that, most of my memories are gone. I can only clearly remember the last five years or so of my life. In my oldest real memory, I was a slave. I didn't work on some nobleman's estate, but instead I did physical labor, construction work. I built roads and buildings, tore down hills and mountains. That's where it was decided someone built like I am would be the most use, I suppose. And while I doubt I need to tell you this, living conditions were miserable. Other slaves withered away and died on a daily basis. Working a noble's estate would have been easier without a doubt, if only for the fact that I would have a specific master. I don't remember anything about my life before becoming a slave. All I have are those few images from which I can guess was I was a part of a caravan. Or perhaps a messenger. I vaguely remember being waylaid. We were vastly outnumbered, massacred with little resistance. Or at least I assumed that's what happened. When I next woke up, I had been stripped bare and was surrounded by men I didn't recognize. The words they spoke were gibberish to my ears, but I could tell from their tone of voice and expressions that the things they were saying were not friendly. They seemed to be mocking me, laughing at me, and you might expect I attempted to protest, but evidently, I had been beaten quite badly while I was unconscious. My joints were stiff and swollen on top of my dehydration, so I could barely move, let alone put up a fight. As strong as I might have been in full health, I was in no condition to do anything then. You have no idea what that's like. How it feels to be abused and humiliated, desperate for food and water. Ho, oh, oh, ho, oh, ho, good sir. I clearly do. Oh, I see. So, as I was saying, I was a slave for one grueling, torturous year. No one treated me like a human being. There was no one from the same part of the world as me and there was no one to come to my aid. Over time, I came to learn their language. Though I can only speak it, I don't know how to read or write. But to be honest, I think I was happier not understanding what people were saying about me. They had many words to describe me, none of them flattering. Some of them would even call me beast. And the longer I was treated as something less than human, the more I began to question whether I really was one. A darkness grew inside me with each repeated insult. I wanted to make them pay for the daily abuse. And who wouldn't? The desire to exact vengeance when you've been mistreated is only natural. It's perfectly reasonable. But they were right about what I was deep down. A beast. And my revenge went far beyond what could be considered reasonable. Four years ago, I was sitting in a carriage as it rattled along a dirt road. This was not the kind of carriage you rode around town in, but a filthy slave transport. It was packed front to back with slaves or soon to be slaves, I suppose I should say. There were men, young women, and even children. Everyone wore a look of hopelessness in their faces, and no one had the strength left to resist. It looked like me a year earlier, deprived of food and water and beaten into submission. The slave trader's guards were armed, of course, swords hanging from their hips, ready to cut down anyone who showed any sign of resistance. So they sat there, lamenting their fate. Sitting beside me was a young girl crying in silence. Glancing over at her, I caught a glimpse of her face. Large chunks of skin seemed to have fallen off it. It was, suffice to say, an unusual sight. But beyond that, I didn't think much of it. I didn't find it disturbing or unpleasant, perhaps because I had a similarly unusual appearance. What caught my attention, though, was the way she was crying. I'm not sure how to describe it, but it seemed different somehow from everyone else crying in the carriage. It was almost like... Her tears were not for herself. Why are you crying? At my question, the girl turned her head up to look at me. Surprise crossed her face for a few brief seconds, but that was her only reaction to my appearance. I assumed the thought process was roughly the same as mine, so she felt no need to fear me. After a moment's hesitation, she said, I'm sad because I didn't get the chance to show my gratitude to people very dear to me. 
her response perplexed me to no end. Why was she concerned about showing gratitude? Why was she not despairing of her own circumstances? Why was that emotion that gripped her in that moment not hatred for the slave trader or sorrow for herself? To this day, I still don't understand. But that wasn't the only thing I found curious. Her voice, despite being soft, cut through the crying and wailing of the other slaves. I pictured it like a single patch of clear water in the middle of a swamp, untainted by its surroundings, gently undulating. One sentence was all she said, but there was something unbelievably calming about the sound of it. For a moment, I was filled with a sense of tranquility. And though you may not believe it, I wanted to get her out of that filthy carriage, to undo the shackles threatening to taint her. Alright guys, I'm gonna have to end the video here for today. Thank you all for watching. We are finally getting into the, the nitty gritty of Yukimasa's story. And we're gonna continue on in the next one. So thank you all for watching.